mentioned, good to be with you um, this evening as we gather together and, and having the opportunity. I, I don't know, I, Jordan mentioned this earlier as he was opening up, but this sort of like, I don't know if you're in this place or not, this kind of post-Christmas, post-New Year's fog where sort of you're getting back to life and, and reality. And I, that's kind of, I'm in this, I feel like I'm in this sort of nebulous um, zone of, of just kind of returning to to the normal, and, and you always think at this time of year of all these changes that you're going to make, resolutions that you want to keep, improvements that are out in front of you, and then you sort of realize that you're barely managing what it is you're already trying to do, and you're not sure how you're going to add um, working out and eating right and reading a book a week and all these other wonderful ideas that you've had over the last few weeks, and, and, and that's kind of where I'm at in that sort of like place right now, so it's good to be here, to, to refocus and to reconnect and to remind myself um, so much of, of what this is really all about, what matters most. I hope that you did have a good couple of weeks, a good time to celebrate with friends and family, to be reminded of, of what Advent really is about and, and to worship Him. Um, I hope that was possible for you. Did anybody get over, over Christmas, anybody get a, a, a good book or maybe go see a good movie? Anybody? Show of hands. That's one of the things my family loves to do is, is maybe go see a, a movie over um, Christmas, take the kids and that sort of thing, go out and see something. So when I was away visiting family in Ohio, we went and saw Into the Woods. Um, turns out that's a musical. Um, <laughs> You should have seen, like, my wife said she cracked up at one point in time, because I have, I have all brothers. So it was my younger brother, my older brother, myself. I, I was in the middle. We're sort of sitting there staring at the screen like, what have we done? You know, like, I don't know what we were expecting. We weren't expecting that. Um, we were a little bit, bit out of place. But I was reminded um, in, in most of what we love in cinema and in a good book, one of the most sort of common themes that, that is employed in literature and, and cinema is that of the unlikely hero. The story of, of someone who seemingly out of nowhere in the face of, of hopelessness, this individual that emerges from sort of complete obscurity to fight the impending evil and to vanquish the enemy and to save the day. It's, it's commonplace. If you think about it, like The, the Hobbit was a big movie this Christmas season, uh, season the, wrapping that up, the story of the Lord of the Rings, the, the Frodo and Bilbo Baggins, there's these hobbits minding their own business in the Shire when Gandalf shows up out of nowhere and, and pulls them into some journey um, to, that's ultimately going to save the world, right? They're just kind of doing their thing. Nobody expects greatness out of them. Um, that's the story that's become so popular in the Hunger Games and in those movies, this um, Katniss who, who in this moment steps up into what she believes is, is a sacrifice of her own life to save her little sister from certain death, all of a sudden becomes kind of this hero that the people rally around in order to fight a, an oppressive government. Um, it's in our superhero movies, even movies like Superman and Spider-Man, when Clark Kent and, and Peter Parker are sort of these their, their personas, when they're not the superheroes, are kind of these somewhat clumsy, unassuming, sort of everyday guys. But when they put their, their tights on and wear a cape and they run out there, you know, they become something altogether different. They become, they become heroes. Um, and we love that. Uh, we love that story. We even love the story of somebody that's kind of on the other side of things, who sees the air in their ways and flips from fighting um, for, for evil to ultimately join the fight for good. Uh, the new Star Wars movies are coming out in, in about a year. The trailers are out now. We love the story of Darth Vader who is trying to entice his, his son to embrace the dark side right in this moment when, when the Emperor in, that, in the, see, is it the Return of the Jedi is, is zapping Luke Skywalker with his finger powers, and, and, and Darth Vader picks him up and throws him over. You know, he harnesses that good. He goes from the dark side and, and becomes sacrifices again himself in, in order to, to save his son and, and fights for the good. And I think that we love these stories and, and stories like them because we all, we all love an underdog. We like to imagine ourselves as, as having some sort of unlikely hero potential locked up 
inside of us that's just waiting to kind of break out and, and save the day. I think this is something that's, that's embedded in the imagination of, of every child. And what's interesting about this is that we find this same sort of storyline, the same themes that are commonplace throughout Scripture. Um, examples of, of God selecting the seemingly least qualified or least gifted individual and using them in miraculous ways. Like, like a shepherd boy who would defeat a, a giant. A, a rural farmer with a speech impediment who would challenge Pharaoh and lead Israel out of Egypt. A prostitute named Rahab who acted on faith and protected God's servants and ultimately saved her own family. A young woman of, of great faith, but absolutely no standing in society was chosen to bear the incarnate son of God and to raise him into adulthood. Tax collectors and, and fishermen who were handpicked by Jesus to follow him and who would be left with the mission of launching the church and proclaiming the gospel all around the world. God has been telling this story. He's been about this story. The story that we've been studying this year is, is the book of Acts. It's the story of the church, and it's this sort of story. It's a story that God has been writing from the very beginning, and it's the story that he continues to write. So let's, as we launch this evening, let's take a few moments just to kind of recap, review where we've been over the last couple of months. Because we began in, in Acts chapter 1 where the disciples who had been previously defeated and hiding in fear following the crucifixion have now been with the resurrected Christ. And they are being left with this clear and compelling mandate. Jesus told them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We're bearing that out. That's a continued process. We, we prayed for John and Carrie and their family tonight as God continues to work this out in the life of the church. In Acts chapter 2, we see the arrival of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in this dramatic and powerful ways with sounds like a mighty rushing wind and tongues of fire. And in the same chapter, we see the birth of the church and an and almost instantaneous explosive growth. Thousands of people are hearing Peter and the disciples preach Jesus and thousands of people are responding in faith and declaring Jesus as their Savior. Out of this explosive growth, we get an amazing description of the church. A community of people that at first glance, when you looked at them, they were different in nearly every possible way. And yet they shared an uncommon unity because of the gospel. Acts says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. The gospel here in the book of Acts is advancing. We saw a lame man healed of his physical deeds, uh, disease, and we saw the same man and thousands of e uh, others healed of the spiritual disease of sin and finding their salvation in Christ. Now this infant church here, in the midst of all of this growth, it begins to face um, some very real problems. It's met with unrelenting opposition. Peter and John are arrested. They're brought before the Sadducees. They're beaten. They're told not to speak in the name of Jesus, but they can't do it. They simply cannot stop preaching Jesus. And despite all of the challenges, all the growing pains, the gospel continues to be proclaimed and people continue to respond to the message of Jesus as the ultimate sacrifice for sin. The opposition now continues to, to escalate. In Acts chapter 7 and chapter 8, um, we see Stephen's unapologetic explanation of the gospel before the Sanhedrin, um, and it results ultimately in, in his martyrdom, um, costing him his life. And now here in the midst of, of Stephen being stoned to death, Luke records that the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Um, and that Saul was um, there to approve of the execution. 
This in this chapter here is the first introduction that we have to Saul, the great persecutor of the church. Um, listen to how Acts describes this climate at the time that we're in here and, and everything that the church is facing. This is Acts 8, verses 1 through 3. And it's referring to Stephen. It says, And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church. And entering house after house, he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. It's now here in the midst of, of this great persecution um, that we discover yet another aspect of the gospel, and that is its ability to reach through barriers, to reach across boundaries with the truth of, of who Jesus is and what he accomplished on the cross. Even when that obstacle, that barrier is hostility, is opposition to the gospel itself. This is where we pick up the story of Saul in Acts chapter 9. And if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there with me. This is Acts chapter 9. We're actually going to read the first 22 verses of, of Acts 9 together. But Paul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a vision of a man named Ananias come, come in and lay hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is this not the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. I love this passage, and, and, and as we think about this, I'm reminded a few weeks ago when we were preaching through John chapter 1, Pastor Prine quoted um, C.S. Lewis, who famously referred to himself as the most unlikely convert in all of England. And if that is the case, then this passage that we just read may very well capture the story of the most unlikely convert in all of human history. Um, and as we look through this passage, as we think about this, I, I want to point out as, as I was preparing um, to preach this sermon, I first read this passage in light of what it was teaching and revealing about Saul. I was reading it as a Saul story. 
But the more I study these verses, I came to recognize that Saul plays, he plays a support role in all of this. The central theme of these verses really teach us more about who God is and, and what he does. Saul just happens to be the one that he is doing what he does in and being who he is. And there are a couple observations that I want to uh, make that stand out to me from these verses about who God is. And the first thing that we discover about God is that, that he is a God who pursues. A God who pursues. Oftentimes when we, when we talk about, when we share stories of, of conversion, we'll talk about someone who is seeking, who is actively looking for, for answers. And in the midst of that, um, they meet Jesus as the ultimate resolution to their questions. Next week, Pastor Jeff is going to preach from, from Acts chapter 8, and he'll use the story of Philip and the Ethiopian. He's going to give an excellent example of this, who happens to be on the road reading prophecies in, in Isaiah, and he's got all of these questions, and Philip sort of um, happens upon him, and he says, can you answer these for him? And Philip gets this open door to, to proclaim the gospel, to outline the gospel to him. The example of Saul in Acts chapter 9 stands in almost exact contrast to that, to that. Saul, in this passage, he's seeking, but he's not seeking Jesus. He's seeking those who, who follow Jesus. He's hunting them down in order to arrest them and to parade them back to Jerusalem as an example as a deterrent to anyone that might be compelled to follow this radical message that the disciples had been preaching. Paul in this passage is hostile. He's in direct opposition to, to Jesus, and it's in that place of hostility and opposition that he is confronted with the truth of who Jesus is. God in this instance does not send a representative. He does not send a, dis, a, a disciple to speak on his behalf. Instead, he chooses to meet Saul on the road to Damascus as himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Saul here is, is familiar with the claims of who Jesus is. He knows what the disciples have been teaching, and he's been doing everything in, in his power to stomp out, to disrupt those teachings. But now on his journey to, to Damascus, he meets Jesus face to face. The one he has had all this hostility towards in, in the midst of his opposition. It's in this moment that Saul is left with, with no defense. God has, has sought him out. He has pursued Saul just as he pursues each and every one of us. This is the, the principal point of what we've been talking about over the last several weeks in, in the incarnation the all-creator God who, who took on flesh, who became one of us to pursue us. Uh, the book of Philippians, I think, says this, describes this so eloquently. This is Philippians chapter 2. It describes this pursuit, verses um, 5 through 8. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. The very, the very same person who is confronted by Jesus here in Acts chapter 9, now he now writes a letter to the church in Philippi, Saul, who, who is later renamed Paul, writes a letter to this church and he assures them that the God who pursued him, who met with him on that road to Damascus, is the very same God that pursued them by taking on human form. It's the very same God that pursues us. There's a 19th century poet um, by the name of Francis Tapas. He captures, he, he captures his own awareness of God's pursuit um, of him in a poem called The Hound of Heaven, retelling his own story, capturing a God that was willing to leave it all in order to pursue him. You see, I think Saul's conversion story in Acts chapter 9, it highlights for us some of the fundamental aspects of the gospel and of our salvation. And that is primarily that God moves towards us. 
he pursues us. For those of, of you that are here, for those of us that are here that, that would call ourselves Christ followers, this is our story. Whether we were seeking or we were in active opposition, wherever we were at on the scale, God pursued us. He reveals himself to us so that we can know him. And if you are here this evening and you have not yet uh, made a decision to follow Christ as your Savior, be certain of this. He is pursuing you. That's who he is. It's embedded in his nature. It's his character. He is a God who pursues. It's here now in the midst of this pursuit that we discover yet another aspect of the character and the nature of God. He also reveals himself to us as the God who provides. The God who provides. Interjected into the midst of this story is, is, of Saul's conversion is the story of Ananias. Ananias is, is sort of minding his own business and following this encounter with Christ. Saul here is, is left blind, completely dependent. He's led by others to, to a house to take up residence and, and, and he waits. He waited for, for what God had in store for him next. And Ananias, as he's minding his own business, um, God comes in and speaks to him and says, I have a job for you to do. So this is what I find so compelling about Saul's story, because I believe that in, in many ways, it's each of our stories. His experience is, is an extreme. It's this physical expression of what we all encounter as we come to Christ in our salvation. It's critical for each of us, if we're going to come to Christ, to come to the place of helplessness. We come to the place where we recognize we have no merit on our own, that we have no case to make on our behalf. It's when we become completely dependent on the one who is greater than we are. This is where Saul finds himself both physically and spiritually, and it's in the midst of this weakness that God sends Ananias. Ananias here, he highlights, he demonstrates God's provision in, in two ways. First, and, and perhaps most obvious, we discover, we see his, his provision for Saul. Through the ministry of, of Ananias, God provides for Saul what he desperately needs the most, restoration and, and affirmation. God uses Ananias to restore Saul, to return his vision, to restore his strength, to prepare him for what God has in store for him next. Additionally, God validates all that Saul has experienced, the encounter that he's had with Christ. In verse 16, it says, And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road to which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The importance of this interaction in the New Testament can hardly be overstated. It's in this restoration, this affirmation that, that ultimately would launch Saul and launch the ministry. Eventually being renamed Paul, he gets into the business of proclaiming the gospel. This moment would forever impact the church and would forever impact the message of Christ around the world. Here then, though, we discover the second aspect of God's provision, and that is his provision for the church. As we mentioned, when we're first introduced to Saul, um, it's not in a very positive light. He's standing at the feet of, of Stephen, the disciple, as he's being stoned to death for his proclamation of the gospel, and he's giving approval to it all. The conversion of Saul was... I think, met with some understandable skepticism by the church. When God speaks to Ananias, Ananias himself responds by saying, are you sure about this one, God? Are you sure you've got this right? Because I've heard some things about what he's doing and who he is. Ananias' ministry to Saul isn't just for Saul. What Ananias sees when he is with him, the work of restoration and affirmation that's taking place in Saul also becomes critical for us, for the, uh, for the current church. Ananias' um, presence with Saul ultimately provides the validation that is necessary within the community to know and to believe in the authentic nature of Saul's conversion. 
Here's the point that, that I want to emphasize from this text. It's that God is in the business of providing. It's who he is. It's what he's done. It's born in his nature and his character. In the book of Genesis, God is referred to as Jehovah Jireh. Yahweh will provide. The book of James says it this way. It says, every good and perfect gift is from the Father coming down from the Father of lights. I remember as, as a relatively young youth pastor, I, I got into a season of ministry that was particularly discouraged, discouraging. I was beginning to question if, if every, all this stuff that I was doing, if the investment, if it was making any impact at all, if the God was using anything and, and, and just had all kinds of questions and discouragement. And, and in the midst of that, a student, uh, seemingly out of nowhere, started attending the, the ministry I was leading. This was at a, a previous church. I don't even know what his connection was, where he came from, that sort of thing. He was kind of a socially awkward kid um, and, and would, would just kind of hang by himself for the most part. And, and in the midst of all this discouragement and, and frustration and everything that was going on, um, oftentimes as I would finish up the evening, um, this particular student would come up to me and say the most profound thing that spoke directly to my heart. In kind of like a, are you an angel kind of way? Like, are, you know, like I sort of was looking around me to see if it looked like I was talking to myself and people were getting worried. But he would speak, he would say things. I remember one time he came up to me and, and said something about his, uh, what impacted him from the evening. I don't remember, but he said, you know what, that really reflects what God's doing in your heart and the leadership that you have in this group. And I thought, I've never heard a high school student say any of those words string together ever. But he spoke directly to, to the need of my heart, and I began to learn something about, about who God is and what he does. And that's what's revealed to us here in this passage, because God knew he's a God of infinite knowledge. He knew exactly what Saul needed. And what the church needed. But then he's also a God of infinite resource. He sends Ananias to provide. And take note of this. He oftentimes, most oftentimes, will use the church as his means to provide. And that's what I find so compelling about who God is in this passage. And it brings us to this last point. That God is a God of purpose. He is a God of purpose almost instantaneously upon Saul's conversion. And we catch this in, in, uh, in Acts 9, verses 20 through 22. I'm not going to read all of this, but it says, Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues. Now Saul is caught up in the momentum of, of the gospel. He is uh, the very message that he was seeking to stamp out and, and to destroy, he is now proclaiming as a one who is a witness to the truth of who Jesus is. You see, when Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, Saul was saved from his sin. Just as each, is, each of us are when we acknowledge Christ as Savior. But, but what we discover in this passage and, and the whole idea of the meaning of repentance, of, of changing direction, not only saved Saul from something, it saved Saul to something. And it does the same for each of us. This is the cycle of the gospel. It pursues us with the truth of who Jesus is and what he has accomplished on our behalf. It provides restoration um, from the damage of sin and affirmation of God's call in our lives. And as that happens, it catches us up in the kingdom business that he is about, and it sends us off with the mission of sharing that message with the world. This is what we learn about who God is. He's a God who pursues. He's a God who provides, but he's a God of purpose. As we think about what we take away from this passage, what I'm reminded of most is that we have a job to do. We've been talking a lot this year as a church about, about this focus on reaching and what that looks like. How do we do that? Opportunities that exist both in these doors in the community. And as I was studying this passage, as I was reading this, I was reminded that, that maybe it's time for me 
Maybe it's time for me to, to do less talking and more doing. That, that we have a job to do. Those of us who have come to know Christ and, and we understand him as Savior and Lord, we get caught up in the gospel momentum and that God places us in specific areas where we have influence so that we might share that message. Because he is a God of purpose. Because that's the business that he's about. And he's given us a job to do. Would you pray with me? Father, we are reminded. We're reminded of who you are and what you are about. What you have accomplished on our behalf. That you came to us so that we could know you. You set us apart. You pursued us. You provided for us and you have given us a job to do. Lord, let us live that, that mission as your church. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.